Hello, this is Dr. Ryan Haas with the University of Buffalo Neurosurgery, taking you through a case that we did recently with the Airflow device, the treatment of a subdural hematoma in addition to middle meningeal artery embolization. But first, we have some background. Chronic subdural hematoma is one of the most common neurosurgical pathologies. One of the main issues with this pathology is that recurrence is extremely high as high as 33% in some series. One technique that's been used recently to reduce the recurrence rate is middle meningeal artery embolization, which essentially seeks to impair the maladaptive healing process that can promote hemorrhage expansion over time. Additionally, use of irrigation after burr holes has been shown to lead to improved hematoma clearance when compared with standard passive drainage. Therefore, combining these two theories, we sought to actively irrigate a subdural to remove the mass effect and lead to better brain reabsorption in addition to doing an MMA embolization to reduce the risk of this chronic subdural hematoma forming. The patient was a 72-year-old male with a past medical history of atrial fibrillation and eliquis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and prior basal cell skin cancer. He presented to the outside emergency room with severe headache and vomiting, but interestingly, no history of trauma. The CT is demonstrated to the left-hand side. He was transferred to our facility after receiving case centra, and on arrival, known to have a severe headache, but was otherwise neurologically intact. He did endorse a history of pulsatile tinnitus, for which an MRI was performed to rule out an underlying vascular lesion, such as an AVM or a dural AV fistula. And it stated this is negative. The patient was then recommend to undergo a left-sided middle meningeal artery embolization two weeks later once the subdural had a chance to liquefy. The patient was brought back for middle meningeal artery embolization as previously scheduled. Preoperative imaging is demonstrated to the right and postoperatively after an eventful procedure we can see that his post embolization image is stable from prior. When the patient was discharged the following day he returned that evening with a trans episode of board fighting difficulties, which resolved on arrival to the emergency room. His follow-up CT to investigate for any worsening of the subdural was stable. His Kepler dose was increased, and he was sent home. The patient was then readmitted the following day. Again, a head CT was obtained. It was stable, but given the patient's persistent symptoms and still fairly sizable subdural, we elected to treat him surgically and remove the mass effect and the irritating blood on the surface of his brain. The patient was then taken to the operating room and underwent subdural hematoma evacuation. We used a four centimeter left side incision over the hematoma, which is standard practice. We did a miniature craniotomy as well, but I must emphasize that this was more of a miniature miniature craniotomy. When you tunnel the airflow device posteriorly, it tends to kink on the um, bone of a normal burr hole. So the normal burr hole was actually enlarged um, and beveled such that that would not occur and the drainage of the subdural could occur unimpededly, hence the term miniature craniotomy. The airflow system was then primed and tunneled into the incision um, prior to dural opening. The dural was then opened and the airflow catheter was placed into the subdural space. Turned it on, uh, we noticed that it was draining appropriately, and we closed up in the standard fashion. The patient's postoperative course was relatively uneventful. He awoke from anesthesia without any issue and was monitored in the neurocritical care unit until discharge. We did obtain daily CT scans to monitor the resolution of the hematoma, and as you can see, there was adequate brain re expansion and good evacuation of the subdural hematoma. Interestingly, you'll note that the acute component also was adequately evacuated through the use of the ear flow. As you can see on the image on the left, on post from day one, it was there, but day three, it's been gone. The patient's symptoms got better. He was discharged without any issue. He's been seen several times in clinic at this point, doing well. The patient has not had a single recurrence at this time. And as you can see here, we just have side-by-side -side CTs showing the patient's initial presentation and essentially showing with the help of the ear flow device we had this very easy automatic draining and irrigation occurring at the same time which allowed for 
adequate subdural hematoma evacuation and excellent brain re-expansion. Now we get to the discussion portion of our case. The first thing to discuss is why we chose to treat the patient in the manner that we did. In our mind, we believe that chronic subdural hematoma treatment can be viewed in two stages. One is the removal of the mass effect that's leading to the patient's symptoms, and the second is to prevent the recurrence, which as we mentioned before, can be as high as 33%. So the traditional treatment method, a drain is typically left behind after evacuation to take out whatever blood is left over to prevent some type of brain re-expansion and get as much hematoma out as possible. But this does not appear to necessarily be as effective as one would hope because again, the recurrence rate is still quite high. So with the use of the ear flow device and the use of MMA embolization, we seek to not only address the patient's complaints in a minimally invasive fashion, but to also alter the outcome to reduce the risk of recurrence. The use of the ear flow device allows consistent irrigation to occur slowly so that the brain has time to slowly re-expand and the hematoma can slowly be resolved to avoid the problem of getting a scan postoperatively after a procedure like this and just having the air be you know, all throughout the patient's head and you, leading to all that extra room for which blood can be accumulated. The second portion of the treatment is the use of the MM embolization, which as I mentioned before, is thought to address the underlying pathologic healing process that can occur when patients develop these things. And that process can promote re-bleeding if those small blood vessels that form are damaged. So therefore, we feel that this treatment naturally addresses the underlying pathology of what's going on and physiologically will help reduce the recurrence rate. Though this technique merits further, further research in order to determine if it's truly better than what's already going on, the ear flow device certainly makes the constant irrigation helpful. And some papers that have discussed active irrigation, such as Japan, have shown that it does lead to a slightly better outcome. In our experience with this technique, we've had quite a positive impact on several patients. So we've currently addressed 21 chronic subdural hematomas using the ear flow device. Created our standard passive drainage cohort, which we did retrospectively go back and collect, patients undergoing active drainage with the ear flow device actually had better hematoma clearance. Now this was actually proved radiographically using computer algorithms to estimate not only clot resolution, but also brain re-expansion. We also noted lower rates of catheter-related infections compared to either TLS drains or JP drains and decreased length of stay of hospitalization, 10.6 days compared to 16.2 days. In addition, there actually had not been any reoccurrences of subdural hematomas after ear flow placement. Given that this is only a small case report, it's difficult to extrapolate the findings from this patient to many of the other patients that are out there. However, what we can conclude is that it's safe and effective to use a miniature craniotomy to place an ear flow catheter for a subdural and to adjunctively treat the patient with MMA embolization. Preliminary data from an institution comparing patients who've undergone ear flow placement for their subdurals compared to standard TLS or JP drain shows that the ear flow was associated with decreased length of stay and increased hematoma clearance with the use of ear flow. In addition, our recurrence rate is 0% for ear flow patients. Of course, further research into the long-term safety and recurrence rates using this treatment needs to be further investigated with idea like case series than a randomized controlled trial. So final conclusions cannot necessarily be drawn from this, though the preliminary results which we have are certainly encouraging for patients suffering from this condition. Thank you.